Hi everyone, um, welcome to our climate week. Um, so I'm Izzy, your Union Affairs Officer, and I'm joined by Lottie, your Community Officer. Um, and we've been working with the Student Sustainability Advisory Board to plan your first ever Climate Week at the Union. So today, to start off Climate Week, we're having a Q&A session with questions submitted by students for the Chancellor at the University of Leeds, um, Professor Dame Jane Francis. So welcome, thank you for speaking with us today um, as part of our Climate Week event. A pleasure, delighted. Um, so the first one is, could you introduce yourself to students and tell us a bit about your career and your journey from working in research and at the University of Leeds to where you are today? Ah, oh, wow, how long have you got? <laughs> so, um, uh, my name's Jane Francis, and I started uh, my sort of um, higher education as a geologist. So I'm a geologist by training, uh, and my speciality is working on rocks and fossils of, of the polar regions. Um, when I did my degree, uh, though, that was a long time ago, in, in the late 70s, actually, when I finished, and there was very little focus on climate change at all, you know, at right. all. Um, but the reason I got into research was that um, when I finished my degree as a geologist, it was very common for uh, most geologists to work in oil companies, uh, core logging, just looking at chips of core, you know, there. But um, in the university milk ground, you know, when the companies come and they advertise their jobs, they used to advertise uh, jobs for geologists. But it always used to say on the bottom, women need not apply because that was the late 70s and women geologists weren't uh, allowed to work either in the Middle East or to work on oil rigs at that time. So that, that uh, career was out for me. So I actually, but I stayed in Southampton, I did my PhD on fossil forests along the Dorset coast. And that's really what has taken me through my scientific career, becoming an expert on uh, fossil plants, but using them to interpret ancient climates. So um, from Southampton, I then had um, a NERC research fellowship. So that was a NERC Natural Environment Research Council um, fellowship for a couple of years to carry on my research. I did that in the University of London. Um, and then uh, what I went to the British Antarctic Survey, actually, because they had some uh, short term contracts after the Falklands War. And I spent a year working on uh, fossil plants, particularly fossil wood from Antarctica that was in their collection. Mm -hmm. So, but I really got caught up in the, the real interest in the polar regions as really important for uh, modern day and past climates. And then when I finished that, um, there was no jobs. There were no jobs in the UK for geologists or for academic research posts because the government were closing a lot of um, geology departments. And so I realized then I would have to go abroad. And so I did actually, I, I through networking, um, um, I was able to be offered a job in a research post in Australia. And I never ever thought I would end up in Australia for sure. Um, but there's a very funny story about how I said yes to that, that you can ask me later. But anyway, I ended up going to Australia. What I thought, I told my parents, bye bye, I'm going to Australia for six months. Anyway, five years later, um, I came back to the UK of, for a job at the University of Leeds. And then from there, um, I, I carried on my career, carried on my research and, and taught through the university. So I sort of worked myself through the university, uh, promoted to various levels until I became Dean of the Faculty of Environment. And then when that sort of uh, post came to an end after five years, th th there was an advert for the director of the British Antarctic Survey. And it was sort of I, as if, you know, I had all the right requirements for that. I, you know, research in the polar regions. I've been to Antarctica probably by that time about 10 times doing scientific expeditions. I've been to the Arctic as well. And I knew quite a lot of the polar community, both in um, Cambridge in Bass and uh, around the world. So it was kind of a natural move in a way. And so this is, this is what I do now. I am a, a government employee, if you like, because British Antarctic Survey is a research centre of the Natural Environment Research Council. Um, and we do research 
uh, about the polar regions, all kinds of research about the polar regions, including a lot on climate change, which I can tell you a bit more about later. And we also um, have a big logistics uh, component. So we have uh, the ship, Sir David Attenborough, that you may have heard about, otherwise known as Boaty McBoatface, but I'm not allowed to call it that. And um, we have, you know, aircraft um, pilots, we have stations in Antarctica, so we have a lot of mountain guides and mechanics and plumbers and carpenters and chefs who look after scientists in, in Antarctica, look after the whole of the UK science community that wants to work in Antarctica. So it's quite a busy life at the moment, and particularly now with COVID, um, trying to get to Antarctica in a COVID world is an extra special challenge. So following on from that, um, and as you mentioned your role at universities, what role can universities and research play when we're tackling the climate, climate crisis? Well, apart from uh, doing the very good research, so Leeds, you know, is very good in research. There's a Priestley Centre that looks at climate research. Um, uh, lots of people in my old school, in School of Earth and Environment and across the Faculty of Environment, but actually now across the whole university I think there's so much now that's focused on climate change so engineering research uh, biodiversity research sustainability anything to do with environment um, a lot of technical subjects and social sciences as well because I think you know the new dimension is how climate change is in, impacting on on people and their homes and habitats and their activities around the world so the university is well placed from that and I think for students, I think for students, there's a challenge really to be really well educated in climate issues these days. And um, I always thought I should tell the university that it would be a really good idea, I think, maybe you should tell them, um, to have a module that every student takes in their first year or some point to really understand about climate change so that you Whatever subject you do, you know, if you do art and design or social science or music or, or ke chemistry, physics, that you understand about, you know, carbon dioxide and the impact that that's having um, and other greenhouse gases, that you understand the impact on melting ice sheets, you know, that you, you understand the global impact of climate change and how it might affect uh, people both living in, you know, everywhere from the polar regions, you know, the Arctic indigenous uh, communities all the way through to the, to the tropics. And I think if, if people really understood the climate system properly, then, you know, it would be, uh, I think everybody will be better informed and would understand what's happening to them, us, everyone, a, a bit better. Um, so kind of going on from that, obviously there is so much to learn. Um, what advice would you give to students who are wanting to pursue a career in climate? And do you have any suggestions of other ways to contribute to work outside of this? So where it might not be their core degree is in, you know, the Faculty of Environment. I was talking in a meeting with people uh, just recently where we were talking about it's not just about climate anymore and understanding greenhouse gases. It's, it's all about, in terms of the natural environment, it also includes things like biodiversity changes you know um as well so that's that's wrapped up in it as well perhaps biology degree it's also there's a huge um movement now about the oceans so this year is the beginning of the decade of the oceans so understanding oceans as well but once you start getting on to all those different environments on earth then you need also to think about the people and so there's it's a quite a complex picture now. So I think there's a huge number of potential career pathways you can go into. And I think um, there's a lot more now on renewable energy and green jobs, sustainability, uh, policy. So I think there's just huge areas in which climate change will focus now. So I think um, if you're really interested in climate and making a difference i think finding some of those jobs will be really really um i think very interesting and a really interesting way to go i think renewable energy and renewable technology is really fascinating at the moment 
So one of the things that has really changed in my life in the last year, and, and this is at work at the British Antarctic Survey, is that the government has embraced, um, you know, net zero, the 2050, and it's the COP meeting, you know, in uh, COP26 in November. And that really has changed a lot of conversations, I think, with government. And it really is becoming at the forefront of a lot of politics. And that has filtered down through to um, UKRI, UK Research and Innovation, which is sort of the, the umbrella organisation for the whole of uh, research. Um, and that also links universities. And UKRI now has a net zero target and NERC has a net zero target. So we've just established our own uh, very strong net zero um, strategy in BAS. Now, so we have a lot of people who work for BAS who are very interested in the environment, you know, because polar regions, um, you know, they generate a lot. There's a lot of people who work for us who are very interested in environment, climate change and animals and, you know, the works. It, it's not for the money. <laughs> and um, um, and so our environmental strategy, we have to meet these net zero targets as well. Now, if you work in an office in London or you lived in a house in Leeds or you worked in an office, even in the university in Leeds, you can sort of see where you can get to net zero by looking at your renewable energy supplier. You know, you can become more sustainable, that kind of thing. When you have huge, big research ship that is mostly run on millions of gallons of fuel, you know, and uh, when you have nine, um, five aircraft that are flying around Antarctica, it's quite hard to become carbon zero. So we do have to, we're no, and we have to accept that we'll never become carbon zero, but uh, at the moment, you know, when you're using a ship, but we're, we're trying to work really hard to, counteract that as much as we can by everything else that we do in Antarctica. So we've been thinking really hard about how we can use less fuel, about how we can um, have sort of like in our stations renewable energy. So we, we have a lot of old buildings that aren't insulated, you know, so I think we're heating up Antarctica by letting all the heat go out through the roof of some of our buildings. So they're all not being knocked down and we're having a proper new buildings built that are well insulated, that are, have solar panels. We're trying out a lot of technology that uh, might work in Antarctica. Some of it doesn't work in Antarctica, though it may work, you know, in Leeds or in Cambridge. Yeah. Just trying to say, make sure we maximise the use of um, our aircraft by not having to fly as much. So, for example, um, we have a lot of data monitoring equipment that's put all over the over Antarctica. So there are bits of equipment that are monitoring climate, temperature, snow, that kind of thing. And all of these bits of equipment require um, servicing once a year, or once every couple of years. You know, you have to change a battery or you have to take out a data card or something like that. So we're trying to automate as much as possible so that we don't have to visit every year. So that cuts down on quite a lot of flying. We are um, trying to invest in, uh, we are investing in a lot of new marine equipment so that instead of our ship, Mr. David Attenborough, having to go backwards and forwards, do a lot of mileage and use a lot of fuel to do surveys of an area which takes time as well as fuel, the ship would stay, stay still. We're going to, we call it the mother ship now. The mother ship stays still. And then from there, we launch autonomous vehicles, you know, sort of the things that look like rockets or sort of submarine robotic gliders that can be launched from the ship and they go out and they then record all the data in the ocean. And they're, they're run either by a small battery or some of them are run by different, the different kinds of power that they can go off uh, by themselves. Sometimes we can leave, leave them out for a year and they just uh, float around. Sometimes they use the energy of the waves and they pop up every now and again and they submit, uh, transmit all their data back by satellite. So, you know, the ship stays still or the ship goes home and then the, these autonomous vehicles are doing all that. So there's all kinds of things that we're trying to do to cut down our carbon footprint in Antarctica. 
it's, uh, some things don't work in Antarctica that work here. So, you know, you think the obvious thing to do would be put up a wind turbine. Um, but, but wind turbines work pretty well in the UK. But if you put up a wind turbine in Antarctica, where the wind blows, the, the, the wind either doesn't blow at all or it absolutely, you know, blizzards. And then wind turbines just get destroyed. I mean, they just get absolutely destroyed. They're a crumpled heap of metal. And so they're pretty useless in many areas. And there's a huge problem with birds, you know, because Antarctica is protected. Um, and we're also doing the same with our headquarters in Cambridge, which is offices, all the kind of things that you do in offices. You know, we're right at this minute, the roof is being exchanged and covered in solar panels. We had a big car park area. It was just a flat area of car park. So we put a roof on the top and put solar panels on the top of the roof. And that pays 10% of our, of our bills, fuel bills, you know, uh, electricity bills. Um, and we've, we've just improved the insulation and things like that. So yeah, we, we're working really hard actually to be as green as possible. Do you think we're starting to see any positive impacts or I suppose, slowing of impacts um, from companies taking up these initiatives and from the government becoming a lot more aware and kind of working towards net zero? Yeah, I think so. I mean, you know, a good example is to some extent, you know, the coal mine in Cumbria, you know, I mean, it was a crazy thing that that was given permission. I mean, coal is the worst polluting uh, carbon source. So to reverse that decision is a, you know, it's a very good, a good thing. And I think there's a lot more um, uh, work now on, on, on um, green energy. You know, a lot of the energy firms are now using renewable energy. There's a lot more companies around the UK that are uh, developing new um, energy rich, uh, green energy applications and things like that. There's a fantastic example in the Isle of Orkney. So quite a lot of people are working with Orkney Council, you know, up in very north of Scotland, because Orkney is a sort of an island and they are a fantastic group of people that have developed all different kinds of green energy. I mean, they have, they have lot, quite a lot of wind up there, so they're turbine ex experts. So we go to them to ask them for advice on how to use wind turbines. Um, they've got tidal turbines as well all kinds of things and they're they're testing out hydrogen too so there are some really inspirational um, companies and and actually in our in our head office in Cambridge we have um, what we call our Aurora innovation space so we have sort of like um, some office space that we rent to SME small small businesses and they're all particularly focused on environmental things so one of the companies, is developing um, sort of window panes that you could put in a building that has sort of solar elements within the window pane so that within the glass of say a, a large office block you could generate energy from the sun through your through the window glass in the in the in the office block i mean you know that's surely the way forward so yeah that would be fantastic that kind of thing so we've kind of spoken about um some of the positive changes that you've seen are there any other um, more wider challenges that you've seen across the world in Leeds um, and other areas of your work? So I think now, um, certainly in, in the British Antarctic Survey, but all the other, a lot of the other polar researchers across the UK, um, the focus is on climate change. And it really is now really focusing, you know, work on, on the ice, on the atmosphere, on the ocean, and on the on the animals and plants as well they it's just all about how climate change affects them and antarctica is quite interesting because you know it's right at the end of the end of the world it's, it's very remote it's miles away from the nearest population and yet it is being affected by what's going on at low latitudes you know and in the tropics and where people live is it's affecting the polar regions and the, the, the polar regions are really sensitive to climate change and it's where change happens the first because of that and so we see it first in in the, in the polar regions and um 
and it gives us a clue, sort of a signal of what's to come, if you like, for the future and for the rest of the globe. And for a long time, I think people have been looking at what's happening in, in Antarctica as a, as a response to climate change. But now we're really sort of understanding that what's happening in Antarctica has a global impact, right? It's not, it's not a local impact. It's really global. So it's sort of getting its own back, if you like, and affecting the rest of the world. And uh, we really understand a lot more now that Antarctica is interconnected with all the systems that operate around the world. So, you know, the, the cold, deep, salty water is generated at the edge of the Antarctic continent because of the ice sheets. And that flows down into the bottom of the ocean and it helps drive this, what's called the ocean conveyor belt all around, really around the, the whole planet, you know, and that's, it's that big ocean conveyor belt of currents that carries the heat and cold around around our planet and um, the ocean is also storing a lot of heat as well but the the really the big question i think is what's happening to the ice sheets on antarctica and for for a long time um we've known that the arctic is you know changing and the arctic the arctic is an, an ocean basin with ice on top sea ice on top and that's warming up um and and melting and then there's land around with ice caps on, you know, that will also be affected and probably is affecting um, our, our weather too in, in, in the UK and in Europe. There's a lot of research going on about that. In Antarctica, for a long time, people thought that uh, Antarctica was such a big block of ice, cold ice, that it was more or less in, in, impenetrable and it wasn't going to be affected by climate change. But now we know differently so, so if you take somewhere like Greenland, that's a big ice cap. It is being affected by heat from the surface, melting it, and water going down through cracks in the ice and lubricating the base. So the Antarctic ice cap, the main one is, is that sits on a rocky uh, core, isn't yet melting terribly fast just from surface temperatures. But the edges of Antarctica, particularly the what's called the West Antarctic Ice Sheet, which is the the thumb bit that sticks up towards South, South America. Um, what we know now is that warming waters, warming ocean waters, are getting underneath the edges of the continent. And that's really, it's believed to be caused by changing in wind patterns that are, that are linked to things that are happening in different parts of the world. And that the winds are blowing warmer ocean waters underneath the edges of the ice sheet, particularly in the areas called the ice shelves, where the glaciers come down and then they float on, on, the, on the, the, the sea at the margins. And what's happening is that um, that warm water is getting underneath and is melting the bottom of those ice shelves. And the crucial point will be, it will be, we haven't yet got to it, I don't think, is that those ice shelves, the glaciers and the ice shelves are, are pinned on, on rock as they come down. But if the warm water gets underneath, that, that pinning, the grounding of the ice sheets might be melted away and then the ice detaches itself from the, from the bedrock and then it will start flowing much faster into the ocean. And if all that glacial ice on land in Antarctica starts flowing into the ocean very fast, that's a huge amount of more fresh water that's sitting on land that will be in the ocean and that will raise sea level. And that has a global impact. So there's a big research group in um, Leeds called Centre for Polar Observation and Modelling um, in, in faculty environment that actually, you know, they've been doing a lot of satellite work on this. And they've been publishing papers recently about sea level rise and, and the impact of what they can see from satellites melting a lot of the ice, edges of the ice and how it's impacting globally. And so sea level is gradually beginning to rise around the whole world due to the melting of this ice. And again, we're using new technology for that. So if we did that years ago, there's no way you could go underneath you know, several hundred kilometers underneath an ice shelf. You'd never, you'd never say, you know, you can sail to the edge and then you come up against this big wall of ice, huge wall of ice. And there's no way we could have gone underneath. But now we do, we have these autonomous vehicles and one of them is called Boating McBoatface, 
his, you know, like a kind of mini submarine. And we can send Boaty McBoatface underneath the ice shelf from, from the mothership and that will go underneath the ice shelf and um, find out what's going on. In fact, now they have cameras on and now they have a lot of instruments on to measure. In the early days, they used to go underneath the ice shelf and then they used to get lost and they never came out again, which is a bit unfortunate because they're quite expensive. <laughs> but um, we lost the signal. But but now that it's all it's much better and they can go in and they take a lot of recordings and they come back again. And we have phenomenal amount of information now about what's going on underneath the ice shelves. So I think um, we'll be able to provide a much better and more accurate indication. And one project in particular called the Thwaites Glacier Project, which is in collaboration with um, the, the US, it's a really, really big project. Uh, unfortunately, it's on hold at the moment because of COVID and getting to Antarctica. But uh, that is looking at a particular area in Antarctica, which if that happens, if the ice shelf detaches from the rock and the warm water gets into a sort of a, a, a part of the ice shelf, which is particularly success, success, susceptible to melting, then I think there could be rapid melting of some of the Antarctic ice sheets. So that's quite a, quite a big project to work on. I suppose one of the challenges we face is when... Um, people don't directly experience the effects of it right now and in that um you know in that space so they potentially don't see that need for action um so how do you communicate issues with people who aren't as engaged in the climate emergency is there anything specific you do to reach out to people who aren't motivated or you know already involved in these kind of conversations hmm. don't you think though now actually compared to even say five years ago that people now see climate change happening don't they i mean even if they live in the uk we've had so many really big storms recently haven't we you know even in the uk flooding and everything like that and our, our weather is really getting we're getting some really extremes of weather some very hot temperatures the hottest the hottest temperature in the uk was in cambridge a couple of years ago wasn't it um i think it was 38.7 degrees and i remember that day because i was in the office and it, and it was getting hot. We've got no um, no air conditioner or anything in Cambridge. And I remember everybody was walking around that day saying, God, oh dear, we're becoming a bit wimps. It's so hot. How, you know, how, we can, how can we work in these temperatures? You know, we need some cooling. And then, and then we got home to find out it was the hottest day ever recorded in, in the UK. Um, do you know, I was talking to um, a researcher in uh, social sciences recently and uh, one of the um, pieces of work that she had done her, she and her group had done was to look at communication about climate change and I think it was globally I think it was through many countries and she I think she's written a paper about it but I she was saying that there's been a step change in the way that people have now responded and react to climate change because they're beginning to see what's happening and they're beginning to understand that it really is a real effect, you know, and it really is happening. You know, that I think the deniers are now decreasing in number or their voices have got a lot less. And there's quite a lot of government action in many countries now. Uh, and, and there's a lot of very strong public concern about it as well. So I think the mood has changed radically in the last couple of years. To, to some extent, it's a bit of a shame that COVID has got in the way because, you know, that now has changed the focus a little bit. Although it's it's good that we have the COP now because I think that will bring the focus back onto, onto climate change. The one thing that I think is really important though, is that there's a lot of talk about mitigation, about how you deal with the, the effects of climate change but I think there's an awful lot we have to do about adaptation to climate change because the climate is is going even if we stopped putting co2 into the atmosphere tomorrow so we kept the co2 level at 410 parts per million or where it is today there's still going to be some time it's going to take time for the earth to sort of balance itself 
as a 410 parts per million world. So at the moment, our, our world is, if you like, still in an ice age world. And, you know, with the big glaciers, in, you know, in the north and in the south. And it's been like that for the last, well, it depends where far you go back, but the Arctic is about 2 million years. You know, we've had ice ages that have come, come and gone. In Antarctica, it's much longer, 40 million years. The ice has been there and, and come and gone. And the CO2 level during that time, or at least for the last sort of 800,000 years where we can measure it with ice cores into the ice, it shows that the carbon dioxide level was never above 300 parts per million. So when you, if you go back, so if you um, drill a core through down through the ice sheets in Antarctica, the Arctic, and you you can see layers of ice that you can date to going back in time, and so you get this big core of ice. It's about it's about that thick, and and they cut it into meter blocks, and then you can chop it up into fine slabs, which you can date. You can tell the age and and. So far, they've managed to drill back to 800,000 years worth of history of ice. And it's got tiny little bubbles in it. And what happens is as the snow falls on the surface in the polar regions, it traps the atmosphere, the current air. And as it gradually builds up into layers and layers and layers more snow, it gradually compresses until it turns the snow into ice through pressure. And it traps the air of the time that the first snow fell in, into these little bubbles. And they're trapped in the ice. And it's really a, an incredibly unique store of ancient atmosphere. It's actually ancient atmosphere in those little bubbles. It's the only, only sort of example of ancient atmosphere there is. Everything else is what we call a proxy. You know, it's an approximation of, of, of it. So people who do this work, they, they collect the ice, they slice it up, and then they crack the ice and, and they release the air in, inside and they can measure the amount of carbon dioxide that was in the atmosphere 800,000 years ago. Um, and if you hold a bit of that ice, actually, and you melt it in your hand, you can hear it popping. It's like, it's like listening to Ice Krispies in milk. So people measure the carbon dioxide level of that. And what they found very consistently is that in the past 800,000 years, the carbon dioxide level in, in our world with an ice cap on it has never risen above 300 parts per million. So that's a really important number. But of course today, the carbon dioxide level is now 410 parts per million. So we're way, way, way above the level of an ice age earth. So if you want to find out what a 410 parts per million earth is like, we have to go back in time, and in fact, we have to go back in time to the rock record. So this is where geology comes in. So we have to look at when did the earth last reach 400 parts per million in its atmosphere? And I think you have to go back about 2 million years, two to 3 million years. And there are groups in, in Leeds actually in, in the School of Environment who were the specialists in this, looking at what's called the Pliocene epoch. So what they find is that, um, that there were ice sheets on Antarctica at that time, but they were a bit smaller. There was no ice in the Arctic at that time or very, very small ice caps. And that the sea levels at that time were much, much higher, sometimes 10 or 20 meters higher. So we've, with the 400 parts per million where we are now, we've still got some catching up to do. Do you understand what I mean? The landscape isn't quite a 400 parts per million landscape. We're still at a 300 parts per million CO2 landscape. So even if we stopped putting carbon dioxide in the atmosphere tomorrow, carbon dioxide hangs around for 100 years or more. And so we're still going to have some warming to come. We can't stop it now, we're in, in there. So we do have to un understand that the climate is going to warm and we have to adapt. It's all about trying to stop carbon dioxide going much higher. But in the meantime, until that takes effect, we have to be prepared to adapt to a world that's high CO2, unless we can actually decrease the carbon dioxide level of the atmosphere by um, you know, doing everything possible not to generate more and then taking out carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere somehow. So I think for you and me, we have to adapt.
when you are kind of working in a field that's dominated by kind of work on climate change and thinking about things like you're saying with the adaptation and having to sort of I suppose persuade people that these are things that we need to do um what's your experience been and what advice would you give on that kind of leadership and on leading people and bringing people along with something where perhaps where people don't still consider it as like the top priority or one of our top priorities so so if i take say the british antarctic survey or the whole polar community in the uk because we do support the whole polar community you know i think um certainly at bass we do a lot of community work so you know we have a website but we go out a lot we go out a lot like university people do we go to out a lot and give talks in schools and clubs and societies we work quite closely with um bbc and a lot of media so you'll see quite a lot of there's a lot been a lot of um press at the moment on melting icebergs that they always get attention um uh so I think talking about it and just explaining the, the facts, the scientific facts to people is quite important. Um, then quite a lot of scientists work for the IPCC, you know, the Inter Intergovernmental Panel for Climate Change and writes, you know, that, and that's a very persuasive document now that, that a lot of governments uh, take note of. We also particularly work with a lot of government agencies. So I think, you know, it's really important to to know the, the structure at the top of the government, you know, there's DEFRA, there's climate change committees, there's there's lots of posts in government. So I had a um, PhD student um, in Earth and Environment. She did her she did her PhD on ancient ancient climates, on um, uh, on fossils and uh, uh, chemistry, ancient chemistry. But she decided ultimately to go and work for government. So she's now working in London. Uh, she's working for Bayes, you know, the uh, government department that looks after science and business and industry. And um, she's one of their climate um, in the climate policy group. So you can you can go there, you know, and, and be very influential in government quite easily, you know, with PhD, with the relevant skills. This week, we've been talking a bit about eco anxiety and sort of the emotional impact that it can start to have when we do have the realisation of the impact it's having on our planet and the need to adapt the way we live in the future and um, did you have any advice for when this does become potentially overwhelming the sort of inevitability of, of what's happening yeah do you know years and years ago when i was in leeds years ago i was um interviewed by somebody who wrote i think it was student newspaper at the time and i was talking to them about climate change and this was I can't, well, it, were, it was going back quite a long way. It would be the 90s, I think it was, you know, before it became really massive, massive topic. And, and so I was talking about climate change. And in the end, I was talking to her and she was really quite scared about this. And she felt that if the climate warms, we we're all going to die, you know? So she said to me, so I was talking to her, you know, the, the planet can cope with it you know it's the planet copes with it the planet has been much much warmer at times you know millions of years ago there were dinosaurs in antarctica at the south pole and forests at the south pole that's what i work on you know and the earth can get much hotter and the earth can get much colder um and the earth take care of itself so it's about human beings and we have to make sure that we can you know make a habitable planet but yeah, there are quite a lot of people now extremely worried about it, but I think uh, explaining what we can do, and I think a lot of people want to feel that they can do something in their lives about it. So I think there's, there is sort of, there are two levels, if you like. So there's, there's the level of which I was mentioning that you can influence government. I mean, you can influence government. You can either go and get a job in government, or you can work with groups that uh, uh, with MPs, with county councils, or with groups, you know, where you can have, if you've got really good skills and good education about and uh, understand climate change, you can be very influential. Um, but I think individually, it's all about living more sustainably, you know. And I'm sure in Leeds, you know a lot about that because Leeds has a, Leeds University has a fantastic sustainability unit, doesn't it? And the union's very good about that. And I think the union in Leeds is ahead of the game in a lot of things in sustainability. But also the other thing is um, understanding the wider aspects of sustainability. 
So I was talking in a Zoom meeting with um, some ecologists uh, last week, another meeting of young people and ecologists. And there were people talking about where well, they were going on a plant-based diet, you know, which is now considered to be one of the ways perhaps to make a better and more sustainable life, which is fine. But I think you have to understand the whole system a bit more. So, because there's so many examples of, if you like, where we've made decisions in the past to go along a certain track without really thinking of the side effects and the knock-on effects of what we've done. You know, we um, want biofuels, you know, or um, um, plant-based plant, plant oils instead of using animal fats. So what happened? You know, you fly over in Malaysia, what you can see are these complete areas of what was rainforest is now completely covered by these rows and rows and rows and rows of palm oil plantations. And then every November in Malaysia, if you go there, you, the, I was at a conference in September, October, and the, the whole air in the Kuala Lumpur, the main capital, was completely uh, thick with smoke. It was really bizarre. And, and then I realized, I learned that quite a lot of people in Malaysia have these really bad breathing problems because of the smoke that comes from the fires that are, that are burned around Malaysia to burn the native forests down for planting new palm oil plantations. So there's, there's huge amounts of sort of consequences of our activities. And so I think whatever we do, I think we, sustainability really does mean understanding the whole cycle of what goes on and I think you know um, trying to understand that a bit more is something I think you guys in the university can really work hard on to let people to help people understand that being sustainable I mean I eat loads of avocados <laughs> and I feel really guilty about that because you know huge areas of rainforest are being cut down to just grow avocados for this new trend so it's about understanding the whole implications of things. And hopefully that's a really good place um, for Climate Week to come in and to look at some of the things that we've got planned for later this week. So we've got some training organised around um, carbon literacy, so like understanding a bit more. Um, and we've got some pledges and one of those is to learn a bit more about climate change. So hopefully that this uh, Q&A fits in with that, that pledge. Um, but yeah, thank you so much for speaking to us. That was really informative. I've, I've learned loads. I'm sure Izzy has as well. Um, and hopefully everyone that's watching this will too. Um, but yeah, if you're looking to get more involved with what we've got on this week for Climate Week, make sure you stay up to date with the LU website. All of our events are on there. We've got loads of exciting things every day. Um, and yeah, thank you for joining. It's a, it's a pleasure. Well, I hope one day you can come down to the British Antarctic Survey when we're open again and hear the cracking of 800,000 year ice because it's quite an amazing experience. Yeah.